When you first go to design a workout program, whether it's for yourself or your work with an athlete or a client, one of the most important things you have to figure out is what are you going to focus on? There's so many different things and goals and adaptations one could be training or exercising or working out for. How do you know what to do? Well, if you don't have a very specific plan in place, you're going to end up doing a little bit of this and that, and you're going to waste time. You're going to spend 17 hours writing workout programs, and oh, you forgot this, and nothing will actually ever get accomplished. So in this episode of 55 Minute Physiology, what I want to do is take you through my process of how I identify what I'm going to train for. This could be, again, for my own self or for an athlete or a client I'm working with. Right? Anyone who's ever done any program design or you know, design workouts is going to tell you this is a cyclical process. So step number one is what we call a needs analysis. And that's really the focus of today's talk. I'll show you my system for how I analyze the needs of a particular athlete or a client. After I do that then, I'll show you how I like to decide on the program goals. Now, sometimes this is already decided for you. So an athlete may show up or a client and say, hey, I'm here working with you because I specifically need this. Okay, so that's a little bit different. So sometimes uh, they'll show up and I need to get better at my sport. You tell me what I need to train for. Okay, great. But sometimes they may say, no, I need speed, or I need strength, or I need muscle mass. Well, sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. In the process of this video, I'll show you how that can occur, and, and then some solutions for that, right? And how actually you can do it, and it'll make it easier for you to get athlete buy-in. But regardless, after you've identified that goals, then you go on with stuff that we've talked about in many other videos which would be you write the program and you adjust what are called the modifiable variables. So this is what this acronym COFAVERP is, it's seven of them. Uh, you know, which exercise to choose, which order to do them in, how much volume, how much frequency, how much exposure, things like that. If you do that properly, you will get that adaptation you're looking for, or the client or the athlete's looking for, and then hopefully a resulting change in performance. Right? Then if you're a good coach, you of course will go back to the beginning. Right? And so we're constantly analyzing and adapting. Right? This worked, this didn't work. We got a little bit better here, but not enough. We already got plenty here, so let's focus more on that. If you're on social media, uh, you're probably, are obviously, uh, you're gonna, and, you, and you follow people in this field, you realize how complicated this stuff is because it's information overload. Right? It's like, well, I need to be training for this and that and that and that. And you're like, oh my God, I'm just, I don't know what to do. Well, hopefully, again, this process will help you triage. It's really more of an algorithm to say, okay, yeah, all these things are important, but what's most important or what I really need to get for that particular goal. So let's jump into this fine addition to our 55-minute physiology lecture series. Now, to first off, think I like to focus how I teach my classes and, and how I think about training as there being six basic adaptations to physical training. Now, uh, there's infinite ones, uh, it just depends on how you want to split them up, but that's not the point here. You can see them how I have them listed. Skill is the first one, all right? This is uh, like a motor skill or motor control. This could be anything from shooting a billiard ball better, a basketball better, it could be running technique, could be squatting technique, whatever, mechanics, right? So it's a skill development issue. Then number two, three, four, and five are actual metrics. So I said, did you get actually faster? Can you move your body more powerfully? Are you stronger? Hypertrophy, did you add muscle mass? And then conditioning is number six, or endurance. Now, in other videos, when I get more complicated, I actually split conditioning endurance up into like 10 different types of endurance conditioning. Uh, same thing with power and strength and all that stuff. But for now, this is just the big overview, right? So I have those six things that I can work on. Uh, you could lump mobility and flexibility in here anywhere you'd like as things you have to have to be able to do these things correctly. But again, just think of the six that I put out here. So how do I actually know what to train for? In other words, which of these six do I pick when I have a new client or athlete or I'm trying to figure out what to do myself? Well, this is the system I like. Step number one is you have to define your goal. Again, in the two scenarios I've already mentioned, maybe this is already defined for you or you don't know, right? So you can sit down and you can watch other videos and other people's stuff to figure out how to set goals and you can look up the acronym SMART and talk to sports psychologists about goal setting and stuff. That's not really what I'm talking about here. But for whatever reason, you've decided and you've set that big goal. But then what I like to do is, is step number two, which is identify the defender. What is defending you from that goal? Sometimes it is synonymous with the goal. In other words, sometimes the reason you're here to get faster is because you're actually just not fast. But other times it's not. 
So the reason you're not fast might not be a speed issue. It might be a movement technique issue. It might be an injury issue. It might be a body mass issue. It might be a strength issue. We don't know. And that's what, they're, that's what the needs analysis is really about, is you're going to do testing to figure out, okay, I know you want to get A, but what's actually really stopping you from getting there? Then once you do that, you set appropriate mini goals. So this is my super lame joke that I tell to my students and I show them and uh, any of them that are watching this right now, they're going to roll their eyes. You're probably going to do the same thing. You'll be like, Andy, that wasn't funny at all, but I don't care. I'm going to do this. All right. So prepare your brace for a not funny, funny joke. This is a picture of Hope Solo. She's awesome, number one, because I'm the, from the Pacific Northwest, so I love all things Washington. Hope was a goalie for University of Washington soccer team and, of course, was on our national team forever. But can you see that what I'm trying to portray in the photo? So behind Hope is the goal. And what's Hope doing? She's defending the goal. Get it? No? All right. My point being, that's really what this, this talk and this lecture is about, is how do you identify what those appropriate uh, and specific defenders are? So I'll give you one example. Say the big goal has been identified as you want to maximize performance at a national high jumping championship. Okay, fine, no problem. Maybe then through your testing and, and analytics, you've decided that there are three things that are actually stopping your athlete from jumping higher. Maybe they pull their hamstring constantly. So because of this, they can't do enough training to actually get faster or more powerful or jump better or improve their technique because they're always hurt. Right? So maybe they have everything. You just got to keep them able to handle the training volume. Or maybe they've got too much body fat. All right? And if I'm fat, I can't go up. It's hard. And, or maybe I have low absolute strength. Now, just because you increase your squat strength by 10 pounds doesn't necessarily mean you jump higher. But if you have poor leg strength, it, it could be that fact. Right? And so then you would go through each one of these defenders and set a very specific, tangible, and measurable mini goal. So for the, ham, the, ham, the constant hamstring pulls, you might come back and say, okay, in order to stop that from happening, we need to improve hamstring flexibility by 15%. Now, don't worry. I know that that's not what you would probably really do for a constant hamstring pull. You'd probably look at mechanics and glute activation, a thousand other things, but just think of this at the conceptual level, right? My point is you're addressing the hamstrings very specifically, and you've set some kind of goal that says we want to improve this by this metric to identify or fix that defender of my hamstring pulls. For the body fat, you want to reduce body fat by, say, 8% or 3% or whatever. Who cares? And then for the leg strength, you want to improve your squat and deadlift by 20%. I know, these again, these numbers are unrealistic most, most of the time, but you know, hopefully you're seeing the point. So then that's what I would do, right? And, and I would come back and I would say, okay, this is what you want. This is what's stopping you from getting what you want. Now let's set little goals to knock that down. And it's actually pretty simple then. It gives the athlete a ton of relief, the parent or the other coaches a ton of relief, uh, because you have a very specific plan to attack what's stopping them from getting what they want. And everybody loves that. This is very, very good and helpful for athlete buy-in. So how do you actually identify these defenders? So I'm going to walk you through in this next and middle section here some of the tests and, and protocols I like to do, or at least a scaffolding in which I happen to think about my testing when an athlete comes in and I'm ident trying to identify those defenders. So this is our quote-unquote needs analysis or, or our testing. I like to break my needs analysis section up into two specific sections, those that are relevant to the sport, the activity, or the athlete. And so... It, Imagine I've got five or six MMA fighters in. I will look at things that are, that are very specific to the sport of MMA. So all of those fighters are going to have the same basic criteria because they're all doing the same basic sport. But then the individual, the athlete one, is specific to the person. All right? So all six of them will maybe have a different composition there. This is also very helpful if you're a high school coach or someone who's actually working with multiple sports at a time. You still want to have a basic scaffolding in your head or actually in your computer or in your office on paper of what are the actual unique demands of those basic sports, right? And then the individualized tailoring of the program goes in the athlete section. So I've got five from the sport listed here and 10 from the athlete. One thing caveat I'll give you here is, is don't just follow my numbers here. Uh, make up your own. Go to clinics, read papers, talk to other coaches, take some off this list you don't like and other ways to do it better. Uh, the actual details here aren't the important thing. It's just the idea that we're taking this type of approach to analyze what our athletes actually need and, and how to address them. All right, so if you disagree with one of these things on my list, 
fantastic. Uh, I would love to, to hear more about that. Okay, so let's jump into them one by one so that you can understand what I'm talking about. So let's start with the sport perspective. All right, so from the sport, number one was energy systems, so let's go into that. A common mistake people make here, in fact, I argue sometimes, I think having a little bit of exercise physiology knowledge uh, regarding energy systems does coaches worse than it does good. Right? Sometimes it's very harmful. And that's because they confuse the movement with the duration of the game. In other words, you have a soccer player and they play a 45-minute half. Don't go back to your exercise physiology textbook and look up what are the energy systems for 45 minute workouts because that's not actually what they're doing. You need to pay attention to what are the movements being done or what are the duration of movements. So in the case of soccer, well this is different from a, for a midfielder versus a defender versus a goalie. And so you need to look at, well okay, uh, my, my athlete who's in this position is doing 10 to 15 second max speed bursts with typically uh, 20 to 30 second active recovery. And I have to do that 40 times in a row per half or something like that, right? Whatever it happens to be. So I can give you an example for MMA. That's what I work with a lot. In grappling, you typically see about 20 to second or so exchanges of maximal effort followed by about 20 or 30 seconds of active kind of rest. Now, if you're in high school or college or uh, Olympic wrestling, well, that's a little different. If you're in Greco wrestling, it's a little different. You get judo slightly different. All these sports have their subtle nuances. But in general, the grappling sports are about 20 to second exchanges or so where it's, it's they're working pretty hard, followed by about that equal time of rest. It's about a one-to-one -one or dress ratio. But in boxing or striking sports, the work to rest ratio is more like three to five seconds, followed by 15 or 20 seconds of recovery. Right? If you see like a four or five punch combination in a fight, that's only that's less than a second. Right? A, a 10 second striking exchange would be dozens, if not 50, 60, 70 strikes. It'd be a huge amount. So you don't really see that. Most striking sports are one or two or three, maybe four strikes in a row would be a, a large combination. That's under one second. And then they're going to kind of actively rest, move around, faint, kind of move, do these things for another 10 or 15 seconds. So I don't care that my fighter fights five five-minute rounds per se. I care what are you actually doing. What's the style of your opponent? So if I'm, I'm, I have an athlete who's going to compete against a wrestler, well, I'm going to test and work a very different energy system than I am if they're going to compete in a boxing match, right? Because I know I don't need you to be able to say go all out da 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 for 35, 45 seconds per se if you're going to go in a kickboxing fight or in a Muay Thai fight. Right? Or the opposite if you're doing a grappling thing. And so pay attention to the movement duration of the, of the sport, not the rules, the length of the quarters, any of that type of stuff in the game. It doesn't necessarily matter. The best example I can give you is baseball. Right, A baseball game takes four hours, <laughs> but the actual demands of movement within the, uh, in baseball are you know, a 10 second sprint every 40 or 50 minutes, basically. So it's very, very different. So don't get fooled up on that. But we do want to have a good depiction and understanding of what are the energy systems of the sport. Now, if you're working with a person who's not in a sport per se, just think about what are the energy systems that they use during their activity. So are they working out? Are they hiking? What are they doing physically most often or oftentimes? And that's going to dictate the energy systems. Are they doing a cycle spin class? Are they doing cardio kickboxing class? Are they walking their dog, what is it they're doing and what are the movement frequencies, what are the work to rest, for the, what are the intervals, and how long are those intervals. Number two here, performance variables. So I've given you one example. Let's say we take the sport of tennis. And what we would want to do is think of what are all the performance variables that are associated needed to be successful in the sport of tennis. I've given you four here. There are probably many, many other ones. Not the point. When you go to do this on your own, I would again encourage you to think of as many as possible. And so you want to do two things. Number one, figure out what are all the things that are important. And number two, how relatively important are each one of those things. So in this example, look at agility. That's the biggest bubble because agility is incredibly important for tennis performance. So is anaerobic capacity. Aerobic capacity is, but that's a little bit more. And then look at grip strength. Okay, that's probably kind of important. But if you spent as much time training your grip as you did agility with a tennis player, you're probably going to lose your job pretty fast. So it's going to be a minor point. That bubble is going to be very, very small. 
If we compare this exact same thing to, say, arm wrestling, you see how those bubbles change? I don't know if your aerobic capacity is that important for an arm wrestler, but grip strength is probably pretty damn important. All right, so again, we're not only listing which ones are important, but how relatively important. And then what other ones are there, right? So there's surely some that are, are important for tennis that we would take off the list for arm wrestling and, and vice versa, right? So don't just put these four up here and move them. You have to gotta think through this stuff a little bit. Number three is what I call performance versus skill. So identify how far down that performance versus skill spectrum is the sport. Take something like golf. Anything that you can do while smoking a cigar and drinking 18 beers and still be pretty good at, <coughs> aka John Daly, it's not very performance based. To me, that's, an, that's almost exclusively a skill sport and it is an extremely high skill sport. Okay, basketball is a little in between. So there's this huge skill component to it with dribbling and shooting, but there's also a major performance component to it. You know, jumping speed, sprinting speed, change of direction, agility, physical performance is very high. And then going further down the spectrum, something like powerlifting. I mean, I know there's technique involved with the deadlift, etc., but let's be real. It's basically a strength movement, right? There's not a tremendous amount of, of neuromuscular skill relative to basketball and certainly not relative to pool or golf or throwing darts or something like that. So that's going to help me understand how much time do I need to spend in the weight room lifting weights versus being on the sport or, or doing sport similar movements and things like that. And again, it'll help me triage and understand what really to train for. And that's the goal of this video. Next is the movement patterns. I've given you some examples, right? Is there, is there shoulder flexion, extension? Is it sagittal plane, frontal plane? Use your biomechanics, use your kinesiology here. Right, is there triple extension, uh, which is something maybe some people have not heard of. Triple extension is often referred to when you extend the hip, knee, and ankle, right? So this is, happens when you do everything from jumping to sprinting to even turning and rotating, right? Because you're extending all three of those joints simultaneously, a snatch. Uh, it's extremely common, probably the most common global movement pattern in all of sport is that triple extension. So an important term uh, to know and understand is why I have a highlight in yellow, right? But what other stuff? Again, think about the activities or the sport that are common, things that are uh, movement patterns that are associated with hockey or just can be very, very different than those things in rugby, all right? So go through your brain and think through your biomechanics class and identify all those general movement patterns. And then, well, uh, lastly here, we're gonna look at common non-trauma injury locations. So I can't do anything about when my fighter's getting kicked in the head. Not, not, not part of my equation. But I can do things about I strained my hamstring running, or I took a step and I, and I blew my Achilles out, right? Or my, I woke up today, my shoulder is just achy. Right? So non-trauma induced injuries. And I bring up this picture here, anyone that's ever watched soccer, uh, this drives me nuts, right? A little tap on the shoulder, and. It, Looks like they've just uh, you know, broken their collarbone in half and then two seconds later they're playing just fine. All right, so we're not talking about acute trauma, we're talking about overuse strains and pulls, right? So if we look at the sport of golf per se, probably the area you'd focus on a lot is the low back, right? Because of all the twist, uh, twisting and torsion going on, especially if we have bad abdominal and bad glute uh, activation going on or proper mechanics, you get a lot of low back strains there. So you would definitely wanna make sure if you're working with a golfer, you're addressing that area, right? Making sure that's something you look for. That might be slightly different than tennis, right? Where we're talking tennis elbow is a big thing and low back, of course. Uh, and that, again, would be also very different from someone like hockey where you'd be really concerned with the adductors because they're on the ice and the legs are splitting out. Uh, and so they get tons of groin pulls and overuse injuries. Um, I don't know a lot of golfers who are pulling groins, consistently anyway. So again, you'd be able to say, okay, I, I'm not that I'm not concerned about a groin of a golfer, but of all the things I have to train for, it, it's just too far down the list. I need to make sure we test and, and monitor the low back movement quality or whatever you're going to do. Again, as I've said before, and this is the last time I'll say it, I promise, it's not that any of these other things aren't important. It's just with the limited amount of time you have with an athlete, especially if you're talking about a, a professional athlete or a college athlete that has NCAA restrictions or a general client. Like time is always a limiting factor. And so you gotta be able to say, oh, look, I know that's important perhaps, but we gotta really focus on the bigger thing. Uh, that big goal we've identified, that's what we're after. And while we're on that note, again, this is why I make them go through that process. We all are clear what the damn big goal is, 
and then what those mini goals are. Everything else is a distraction, potentially. If you have more time and you're more interested, we can add more things. But we're not going to cut out that big goal and get distracted with something else if time is the issue. So those are several things from the sport or activity perspective that I consider with my needs analysis. Let's go to the individualized section of the athlete. So step number one, body composition and body mass. Depending on who I'm working with, if it's an, it's an athlete who's extremely lean already, I might just not even put this in the equation. If it's a football player like Vernon Davis. Vernon, I, I was fortunate enough to work with when he was training for the NFL Combine, you know, 10 years or 15 years ago or whatever. He was already walking in looking sculpted. Body composition was just not important. So we didn't waste time adding that to his metric because he might have gone from 9% to 8 or something, and, and who cares? It didn't matter. He, all, he performed well. He looked good. Didn't matter. Save time. We cut it out. At the exact same time, though, a guy named Marcus Hagens was training. And Marcus was a little bit different. He played quarterback at Virginia, and so he was probably 220 pounds or something like that. But he was going to have to play wide receiver or wanted to play wide receiver in the NFL. Well, he wasn't necessarily the leanest guy we've ever seen. Uh, he was simply overweight. I don't exactly remember what his body composition was. It, but this was actually turned in to be body comp was one of the, if not the most important thing. For some reasons, number one, physically he had to look the part, right? Part of the NFL draft says you have to look a certain way. They, t they look at you with your shirt off and they uh, inspect you and stuff. And if you just look kind of sloppy or over fat and you want to be a skill position guy, it just wasn't going to work. So we, that had to be a major part of the deal. In addition, he was a fast athletic guy, but he wasn't super fast. I think he was something like a 4-7 and change, if kind of 40 guy, which is not tremendously fast for an NFL receiver. Well, we knew if we could just take 10 or 15 pounds of body fat off of him, that alone would be like running a 40-yard dash without a 10-pound or 15-pound vest on. So if we could cut two tenths off his or three tenths off his 40-yard dash time by simply making him uh, improving his body composition, that can be millions of dollars. And that's in fact, that's exactly what did happen. We were able to see pretty large improvements in his vertical jump and 40-yard dash far more than any other athlete, not because he did more speed work or anything like that, but simply because he took that big old vest off, basically. So he ended up getting drafted, I think, in the seventh round or late round guy, uh, spent some time with the St. Louis Rams, had a three or four year career, something like that, made several million dollars, and I think is on NFL pension. And so for him, body composition was extremely important. Right? So that's something you might consider with your athlete. Does it matter for you? Does it not matter for you? Another example is something like aerobic capacity. So uh, about 10 years ago, I went through every piece of literature ever published on any combat sport athlete. This was uh, 17 or 1800 studies. And I plotted this graph. And what this shows you is combat sport performance, so how well they did. Did they win more fights, yes or no? If they won more fights, this would be higher. They'd go higher up that list vertically. And I plotted that against their VO2 max. And what you can see there pretty clearly around 40 to 45 milliliters per kilogram body weight per minute, if they improved their VO2 max, they won more fights. But after they got past 55 or so milliliters per kilogram per minute, improving their VO2 max further didn't mean they won any more fights. So this is very common for many sports. There's kind of a minimal amount of aerobic fitness you have to have. But going from good to great didn't improve them anymore. And so if I have an athlete that comes in and I suspect or I know they're in the middle to kind of bottom of that VO2 max, I might do a VO2 max test on them. And so we can track progress there. I want to see how bad they are. But if I know they're already super fit, they're one of my guys that are like Patrick Cummins that are 60 plus all the time. I don't vary to max test him very often for the max number anyways, because I know he's going to be super high up there. Now I know the UFC Performance Institute has done this uh, recently, and I think they've released their data. Um, it was funny, as I mentioned, it's about 15 years after I did this, but it actually lines up pretty well with, with what I found. So this is actually from their actual fighters. So that's really cool. Uh, I've actually had some athletes before that have come in when they're super overweight or out of shape and they want to get a VO2 max test done and I'm like, there's no point, uh, but they push so we do it and they end up being 35 or 40. And I'm like, well, you're not in shape. This doesn't really matter, right? And so, again, this is how we can save time of what are we deciding what to test for, what to train for, what not to test for. In the case of someone who shows up unfit, a uh, fighter anyways, I'm not going to have them work on their VO2 max. They, if they haven't trained anything in three months. Like you just need to get back to training and then come back in and we'll see. Right? 
Anaerobic capacity would be a similar thing. Now, anaerobic capacity is not your ability to jump high. It's not your maximum strength. We're talking about your maximal anaerobic capacity. So how much work can you do in, say, 30 seconds to two or three minutes of, of all-out work? Right? This is your interval kind of stuff. You know, what's that maximum number look like? Well, if I had something like a table tennis player, I'm probably not super, super concerned with their aerobic capacity, maybe a little bit. Right? But I don't know what the average exchange is in a table tennis or a ping pong match, but they're not doing something all out for 45 seconds. Um, it's probably much shorter. Compare that to something like a CrossFit. Well, they might, right? This is, this is actually super important to them. So their anaerobic, maximal anaerobic capacity, something that you get from like a Wingate test, if you're familiar with that, that would be something I'd be concerned with. So depending on your sport or activity, MMA is a good example. I'm very much concerned with that number. Uh, hockey is a good example. We test the Anaheim Ducks very regularly with this. NFL players, uh, we want to see what they're at with this metric. We very rarely test a maximal aerobic capacity with a hockey player. Uh, we would um, it, for other reasons, but the maximal number, not often. Kind of going further down that line of conditioning um, or, or muscle stuff, looking at other things like muscle performance. So. Who knows, right? It could be agility, 5-10-5 test, vertical jump, max strength, max reps. Whatever it is you feel like from a muscle performance you need to get information on, uh, you would look out for that individual athlete. So again, you can imagine you have a, we actually had this, one, actually in the same uh, time that we were working with Vernon, there was an old NFL vet offensive lineman there, or fullback really, sorry Mike, played for, for, played for the Saints for a long time. Uh, all the combine guys are working on their 225 test, right? So in the NFL combine, they have to do as many reps as they can at 225 pounds. So we train that part of the combine. And Mike came in one day and just did like 40 in front of him, just to sort of show them he was better than them or whatever. But someone like Mike, it was never a part of his pre or post testing because I knew even not training for it, you know, years ago, he's already benched. And that was never going to be his limiting factor in his football performance. So he did other stuff like his 5-10-5 and vertical jump and things, but the 225 test was never part of his equation. Athletes that are weaker, maybe that is a part of their equation. And then also things like injury history, right? If you have an athlete who's been around like Cal Ripken Jr., uh, like Russell Wilson, who have, you know, breaking records in the NFL or breaking records in Major League Baseball for uh, consecutive starts or games played without missing a game. I think Cal Ripken played over 2,000 consecutive baseball games. That's 160 baseball games this year. I mean, you do the math there, right? 12, 13, 14, something like that years without missing a single basketball game or baseball game. Never rolled an ankle one time, never got a cold or a flu. I mean, that's insane. I'm probably not going to waste a tremendous amount of time on injury screening. I'm not going to FMS Cal Ripken every month. He, he, obviously, he doesn't get injured. It's, I'm not saying I'm just going to completely let that go but I'm just not going to occupy a huge amount of his time. Contrast that with somebody like Ken Griffey Jr., who missed, I don't know, a third of his, of his Major League Baseball career with injury, hamstring pulls constantly. Uh, he's also notorious for not working out, not wanting to, to do a lot of, of strength conditioning. Well, someone like that, I'm going to spend a tremendous amount of time on movement quality and, and muscle activation and things like that because that is important, right? So again, this is how we triage between people of what we're going to do. So that's the stuff from the, the perspective of the sport and the perspective of the athlete. So now what I want to do is talk about the testing order. And so basically the guidelines are, this is very similar to one of my other videos, basically an exercise order that you can go watch. Anthropometrics is just height, weight, you know, limb lengths, things like that. Uh, but basically what you're going to do is the non-fatiguing stuff all the way down to the aerobic capacity. I'm not going to walk you through this entire list, but you should stop and hit pause and take a look at all this. Right? Uh, you, can, you can see you can do speed power, speed stuff first, then power testing, then strength, and then your conditioning stuff at the end. Now, I wouldn't do all these in the same day. That'd be way too much. Um, so you'd probably split this testing if you want to do this many things over multiple days. Just make sure you don't violate the exercise order within the same day. So this could be maybe you've decided to do two days of total testing. Day one, you do uh, an agility test and then a vertical jump test, and then a strength test, and then a wind gate. And then day two, you do uh, another different type of agility test, and then a medicine ball throw for power, a different strength movement, and then that's when you do your VO2 max. You know, something like that, right? So you can mix them up that way. You don't have to follow order within multiple days, but just within those individual days, don't do your VO2 max test before you go do your max back squat test. 
right? Or before you do your 40 yard dash test. That wouldn't make any sense. You'd get poor results. So once we've done all that and we've collected our information, how do I know what to actually train for or, to, or what goal to actually pick? Well, let's go back to these six different adaptations. Well, to me, the first thing you have to do is identify and understand the said principle. That stands for specific adaptation to imposed demand. What this basically means is the best thing you could ever do to get better at shooting free throws is shoot free throws. Right? The, the adaptation you get is specific to the demand you place. So if you place a demand on the hamstrings to contract with more maximal strength, that's what they'll do. And so the best way to improve the maximal strength of your hamstrings is to do maximum or close to maximum things that require hamstrings to contract. So that's first. You identify a very, very specific problem. Make sure that you are doing something very specific with that muscle group or that action or that energy system or whatever it is you're going after. Right? The adaptation is specific is all that means. So if we look at this again, what typically drives adaptations in these areas for skill, it is practice, right? You have to do the thing a lot. that You've heard the 10,000 reps thing, okay? The concept is true, right? It just takes a lot of practice. For speed, just make sure you're doing something that is light and fast. For power, it's a little bit heavier, but still kind of fast, kind of moving in a different range. For strength, it has to be something heavy. For hypertrophy, it's kind of heavy, but you got to do a lot of volume. And then conditioning something to get you tired. If you do that, you're probably going to move them a lot closer towards those individual goals or whichever one you're working on. A couple other things, what about fat loss? Now I handle this in any of my physiology of fat loss videos, but basically this is going to be driven from somewhere down the, this end of the spectrum. Hypertrophy conditioning, a little bit of strength work is what you would do to select or what you would select if, if you've identified fat loss as the primary goal. Of course, nutrition plays a much bigger part, but you know, programming wise, this is what you would do. What about rehab or prehab? Right? What if it's an injury issue? Well, that could come from any one of these areas. So maybe you have to rehab a hamstring by getting it stronger. Or maybe it is a skill. Maybe you're not firing or sequencing properly. So that'd be a skill issue. Maybe the reason your shoulder hurts is because one of your traps is smaller. Right? Or off whatever, right? It could be a hypertrophy issue. You just need to get bigger rhomboids, right? They're weak and they're small. Or it could be the reason you're having this movement pattern dysfunction is fatigue, right? So maybe you move really well until you get tired and you break down, you lose flexion in your back, and now that's why your low back starts to hurt, right? Or in the case of the, the golfer, maybe they're fine in the first tee, but as they get more fatigued at the end of the round, they start letting their abs off and glutes off, they lose lack position, that's why they get tired. Right. So skill won't necessarily help that. That's a conditioning issue. It's conditioning of the skill. My point being, again, why are you not moving well? Or why are you moving improperly? Is it a strength issue, activation, skill, et cetera, et cetera, and fix it that way. For general health, someone just comes to you and says, I want to get healthier. Well, then that could be anything, right? Now, all, all of those different training adaptations play a critical role in overall human health. Now that you've figured out what to train for, the defenders, you've gone through the needs analysis, just a little bit at the end here about what type of workouts to actually do. Now, before I get going any further, I have covered this stuff all pretty extensively in other videos. So check it out on my YouTube page or my Patreon account, www.patreon.com forward slash Andy Galpin. Uh, all these videos are up on that. Uh, these are in a combination of 5-minute, 25-minute, and 55-minute physiology videos. So enjoy the rest of those, particularly the exercise choice video. But the big concept here is the methods are many and the concepts are few. Now, lots of people have said this before in different combinations of words, but this is really what we're getting at. Right? So my point is, you've identified you need to get more powerful. Don't worry about the very specific methods because those are infinite. Just hit the concept. So as long as you're hitting those appropriate ideas, the methods are really, really, really infinite, right? And that's because programming is both an art and a science. So we've talked about this, uh, you, you've heard about this in, in infinite areas of life, but the scientific side is the concept. The art is the methods, right? So 
Here, in other videos, I've outlined what are the scientific concepts of power training, what are the scientific concepts, etc. How many reps should I do? What's the weight? What are the things I need to do to make sure I'm training to be more powerful? I think I have this in a big 55-minute video, actually, and several. The artistic side is, well, did you like to use a kettlebell versus a dumbbell? Or did you like to use a band? Or did you like to use post-activation potentiation or contrast? That's more of an art thing and less of a science. I'm not saying there isn't any science to it. I'm just saying it's less so. It's more important to make sure you're doing the things like I pointed out earlier. For power, got to be kind of heavy and fast. For speed, got to be fast. So make sure that the athlete's moving fast and you're probably going to get faster. You play with the methods, right? So the example I like to give here is the chromatic scale. So I'm not musically talented at all. Natasha, my wife is. Hopefully some of you are. But apparently there are 12 scales in the chromatic scale. So in the history of all music, for the most part, it's all come from different combinations of those same 12 concepts. Right? And so someone who makes a sound like this is using the exact same 12 methods, or some same 12 concepts, but applying it in a different method than someone like KRS-One. And he's doing it someone differently than someone like Pearl Jam. So we can get these contrasting different sounds because the artistic side of them is combining those same concepts differently. It's all good music, but it's all very, very different, right? And so that's what I mean by using the same concept, the same 12 things, but use your artistic expression to make it look different, feel different, perform it slightly differently. So what are some of those scientific concepts from a global scale? Number one, you need to pick your needs analysis of your sport items, said principle, right? Specific adaptation to impose demand. Tell me what you need to work on, then go work on it. Number two, it needs to be some sort of progressive overload. And so we have to have some sort of balance between stress and recovery. This is program design at its real heart. This is the difficulty of it, right? So if I don't progress load or intensity or reduced volume, or if I don't have some type of progression, I'm not going to continue to get any better. But if I progress too much, like the third point, then I'm going to get hurt, or then I'll stop making progress, right? And so we want to slightly, this could be, again, adding more repetitions, it could be adding more weight, it could be adding more complexity, it could be reducing the rest intervals, who knows, but something has to progressively get better. Right. And, and these concepts, again, are true no matter which adaptation you're talking about. So the third one, balance said, and what I've abbreviated as long-term athletic development here. This is a little bit different than like developing a youth athlete. But my point is being this. Yes, the best way for you to ever get stronger at your bench press is to do a one rep max bench press, theoretically. But if all you did all day was put on your max, your 100% of your max, and try to gift it up, try to lift it up, that's your only training program. That's going to work for a short amount of time, but eventually that's going to plateau. And so you want to balance that very specific training with long-term progression. So in the world of program design or periodization, what we typically look like is this. The farther out from competition you are, the more of that LTAD, the more very general stuff you do. And so you would do bench press sets of 10, 15, you would build a base, you would add hypertrophy, you do sets of five, six, whatever you're going to do. Then as you get closer and closer to competition, you get more and more and more specific, right? But if you're too specific for too long, you get overuse injuries, right? The, the risk of that goes really high. The risk of plateau goes really high. If you don't do specific enough, you don't actually get enough imposed demand of what you're actually needing. And so we want to balance that general and specific. And again, typically the way to do that is to be very general farther out from competition, be more specific as you get closer. If there is no said competition time, what you would do is a little bit of both, right? So do some very specific work, but then complement that with some non-specific work. So yeah, do your very heavy bench press, but then also on other days, do push-up variations, do a unilateral dumbbells, uh, multiple rep ranges, do different things like that. Of course, work your back, all that stuff. And the last one is maximize adherence. So none of these concepts matter. Your program design doesn't matter at all if your athlete doesn't do them, if your client can't stick to them. Consistency matters most, right? So figure out, well, he likes to do the heavy one or max stuff, but hates doing the, the volume work. Well, 
figure out how you can get him then. The example I give there is when I used to train professional athletes full time, we'd have a hard time getting them to show up on Saturday because we were down in Phoenix, so they always fly up to Vegas for the weekend and they would never show up to Saturday workouts. And Saturday is, is when we would do a lot of the mobility, a lot of the maintenance work, a lot of the non-sexy kind of boring stuff and recovery and, and chiropractic and all this stuff, and, and they just wouldn't show up for it. And so we had to incentivize them a little bit, and what we did is we said, all right, look, you know what? Saturdays are gun show days. So you're going to show up Saturday, we're going to do a little bit of abs, and we're going to do all buys and tries. And we would go around the room, and if there's 10 guys sitting around, we'd be like, okay, you pick your favorite bicep exercise. You pick yours and you pick one. And you pick your favorite try and you pick your favorite try and pick your favorite try. I don't care what you do. We didn't program at all. We let them do whatever the hell they want. But they didn't get to do it until they finished their maintenance work. And so we didn't tell them that part. We basically just said, you show up. Okay, we do all this stuff first, then we do gun show dub. And our, and our adherence and our, our participation basically went to 100%. Everyone showed up. Even if they went to Vegas, they flew back or hung over, they showed up. They got their maintenance stuff in, got whatever things we needed to get worked on, and then they got to pump their own. Right, So it's something that we didn't need them, their biceps to be any bigger, getting ready for the NFL Combine, especially guys like Vernon. But that's what we had to do to drive it, uh, adherence. So that's a big concept. In terms of the art, that comes down to things like your motivational tactics, the time of day you like to work out. Again, I mentioned the equipment. Do you like a BOSU ball? Do you like kettlebells? Do you like your periodization philosophy, the time of day, etc., etc., etc. I'm not saying this stuff isn't important or it's not scientific. It is. But that really comes down to the art and the context, the situation, who you're working with, the type of client, what, what do you have access to, what do you not have access to. Uh, you can get things done. Right? You can get almost the exact same thing done with a kettlebell that you can a dumbbell. Very similar to a barbell in a lot of aspects. There's a huge crossover. Not the same, but there's a huge crossover is the point. All right, so how do I know which exact exercise to pick? Again, check this out. I actually have an exercise selection and exercise choice video up, multiple of them, so go check those out. But basically what we're talking about is this, right? You did the needs analysis, and now you've decided on the program design. And now we're going to that modifiable variables, that choice, order, frequency, and things like that. Okay. So to get into these modifiable variables a little bit, we'll talk about this separately in other material, but there's seven of them, the choice, uh, order, frequency, progression, intensity, volume, and rest. Some people have six, some people have eight. It doesn't matter. It's just helping you think of them conceptually. But I want to test your learning now. So here you go. All right. What I have is a list, one, two, three, four, and then A, B, C. So which one of these match the following? I'll give you a second to pause the video. All right, so see if you can match them. Oh, and then I'll give you a hint, by the way. It's a trick question. Right? So if you've seen some of the other videos, you'd know that this isn't necessarily true. Right? So a bicep curl, in other words, the exercise, doesn't necessarily determine the exact adaptation. It's the application of the exercise. So a bicep curl could be for power if you did it powerfully. It could be for strength if you did it heavy. It could be for endurance if you did a lot more repetitions. So I will grant you things like a snatch aren't particularly good to use for hypertrophy. And an elliptical isn't the best choice ever for power. But at the, at the basic level, any exercise can be used for any adaptation. It's not the exercise per se. It's the application. How fast did you do it? How many reps did you do it? How heavy was it? Right, et cetera, et cetera. I've expanded on this concept in other videos. But the big concept, again, exercises do not determine adaptation. Application determines adaptation. The exercises, right, the application, as I just mentioned, the speed, technique, all that stuff determines it. Um, so I'll give you one example over here. Just because I program a squat doesn't mean you're going to be using your hamstrings. Right? If you're using a wide squat or a more narrow squat or you lean more forward or you're, you're different anthropometrics, that could be really heavily using the hamstrings and glutes and it could be using the quads. Right? Two people doing the exact type, just type of, of squat, you, you program front squats, narrow stance front squats. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a quad activator. It really depends on the person, right? Depends on their technique. And are they sitting back with their hips? Are they driving straight down? What are they doing? So the application, how they execute the exercise determines things like which muscles being used, what adaptation I've got to get. The exercises do determine several things though. The movement plane, of course, right? Uh, my sagittal, frontal, transverse. 
the muscles and the joints being used generally. Uh, the contraction type right, is, is an isometric, concentric, eccentric. And then the technical proficiency is that last one, right? So uh, giving, giving an athlete an exercise that they're not technically proficient in is going to change a lot and determine a lot of the exercise, so what you get out of it. All right? So another kind of a trick question here. Just go along with me, but I'm telling you it's a trick. Okay, on the top of the screen you see cardio and then you have strength. And I'm going to flash you up some pictures. I want you to tell me which column it would go in. I know the obvious answer here is, it depends on the application, right? But let's just follow along and see. So where does that exercise go? That's cardio, right? Perfect. How about that one? Look at Jason, squatting heavy there. Ah, that's a strength exercise. What about jogging? Ah, okay, that's cardio. And what about heavy lifting, overhead press? Look at Janie go. Okay, that's strength. Well, obviously, hopefully you're getting a feel of what I'm talking about here, but that's false, right? I don't know what adaptation you're going to get. It depends on the execution, right, and what we're actually doing. So a very good example of that uh, I got from my friend Cal Dietz. So you can listen to an episode or on uh, the Barbell Shrugged podcast I did with Cal, um, episode 217, but he is a legendary strength and conditioning coach at the University of Minnesota, has coached a ton of national champions and uh, other world champions in track and field and throwers and things like that. Well, on this podcast, he described how he said, look, I got 300 plus pound football players and shot putters. I need them to do some cardio, but I can't have them go jog for 30 minutes. It's going to blow their backs and knees to pieces. So he does cardio by having them do one repetition of 50% of their bench, then one repetition of 50% of their squat. And they just cycle back through that for 30 minutes. So they get two things lined up together, and they go one rep, one rep, one rep. And he can get the same exact cardio workout done without actually having to jog or swim or cycle. And so we really, I want you to really expand your mind and think about that type of stuff. As long as I'm getting the concept, continuously moving for 30 minutes, the other stuff is art, right? You like to jog, you like to cycle, you want to set up a little circuit. I know my friend and colleague PJ Nessler has done this a lot with MMA fighters set up a little circuit and you got to move around, they drag a sled and they maybe push something, throw some dumbbell or throw some medicine balls, uh, planks, and you just kind of have a combination. It's all very low intensity. It's not this killer circuit. It's just trying to get them to move and not stop for 30 minutes, but not having these spiders jog. Um, I have a couple that do this, but the vast majority of athletes I work with, I typically recommend we don't need a lot of road work. Right? If you want to get a 30 or 45 minute uh, steady state exercise in, that's fine, but I want to do something a little bit different uh, unless you're very good and, and used to running. Right? So that's just another example of the exercise itself, jogging, doesn't determine cardio or vice versa. Right? We can use anything to get there. On the opposite of this spectrum, people abuse box jumps all the time. I'm not against box jumps, but they think of this as a power exercise. Well, I'm going to improve my power, I'm going to do box jumps. Okay, great. Jumping is a good way to improve power. Oh, but you're going to do 50 in a row? You can do a set of 100? You can do the max amount of reps you can do in five minutes? Well, it's not a power exercise if you aren't jumping powerfully. So if you're doing a bunch of repetitions in a row, you have to reduce power output because fatigue sets in. And if you're doing something sub-maximally, how are you getting better at maximal? So if you're using box jumps for conditioning, cool. If you're using box jumps a whole bunch in a row trying to get powerful, you're using the wrong exercise for the wrong adaptation, right? Remember, it's not the exercise. A box jump alone doesn't make you more powerful. It's the application, the sets, the reps, the intensity, the volume. So there's another good example of one exercise that can be used for two totally diametrically opposed adaptations. Could be great for anaerobic conditioning if you do a bunch in a row. Could be great for power if you do one or two in a row as high as you possibly can. So it's the execution, again, that matters, folks. I've given other examples of these two things. Uh, this is me doing this funny, goofy little exercise, a uh, one-armed kettlebell, one-legged, single-leg squat on a BOSU or on a medicine ball on a snatch. Right? And so when we're trying to figure out which one of these exercises is better, there's a whole host of things we want to uh, consider, but those are outlined in the exercise choice, or outlined in the exercise choice video. So to wrap up, when you do that, when you finalize this whole system, the last thing I do then is go through my three-step system, which is one, identify the goal, 
We've covered that today. And then I want to balance. So I make sure that, okay, I need to get my hamstrings stronger. Okay, I can't just do hamstring strength. I got to make sure that I'm balanced. So I got to balance that by doing some quad work. And I got to balance the joint by doing some adductor and abductor work, right? So that I make sure that joint is stable and moving correctly because I know the hamstring is about to get loaded a bunch. Or overhead pressing or bench pressing. The example I gave bench pressing, right? So I want to make sure I'm balancing the shoulder joint by doing a bunch of, or maybe even extra pulling work, right? Or rotational work, whatever it happens to be, right? Balancing that system out. And then the third step is individualized. Um, so we can get there with our exercise choice. So you don't like dumbbells, you like, oh, okay, great. Well, we can individualize things a little bit better um, to get to wherever we want to get. So that's it. Hopefully you've learned a lot about how to select which types of things to train for when you've got a new client or an athlete or even yourself. If you appreciated this, uh, I would greatly appreciate your support. You can subscribe to this YouTube page. You can check out other videos on my page or my website, andygalpin.com, my Patreon page. Uh, I use all that money. Actually, I give that to students. And that's the honest answer. Uh, they help me make these videos. They help me organize this stuff. I got a bunch of new things coming where I'm going to be creating notes for these and summaries and guidelines, uh, but I have to be able to make this viable and these videos take me a tremendous amount of time so anything that you'd be able to contribute on patreon would be fantastic you can sign up there and find me there and contribute a buck or two to the videos and i take that money give it to my students or interns or volunteers and they're able to create um, some unique stuff that's going to help you even more uh, get what you want in these videos so i appreciate that support you can also check me out on, on all of my social media platforms uh, Dr. Dr. Andy Galpin, and yeah, until next time, get out there, do something fun, go train, go do something you haven't done in a long time, try that, right, do something that's not specific to your goal, and do something different, so good training, be strong, see you later.